Great, thanks. And uh, thanks to the organizers for providing me with this uh, opportunity to speak to you. Um, so uh, as, as mentioned in the intro, I'm an employee of Sangamo Therapeutics. And at Sangamo, over the past several years, we've been using gene editing technologies to both um, better understand the transcriptional biology of erythropoiesis, as well as to develop um, candidate um, therapeutic molecules. And uh, these studies performed by both ourselves and our collaborators, the sort of arc of those studies have, have turned out quite well at this point and uh, to the point where we now have um, clinical trials underway, um, a beta thal trial sponsored by Sangamo and um, a, a sickle trial sponsored by um, our collaborators at uh, Sanofi. And so that's what I'll describe to you today. So um, or I'll describe those arc of experiments today. Um, so just uh, uh, probably a, a slide that really um, doesn't need to be, to be dwelled on for very long. This is a, uh, just to remind you all about the global health burden of hemoglobinopathies, um, uh, essentially millions li living with beta thalassemia or sickle cell disease, hundreds of thousands of annual births, um, um, substantial mortality, morbidity, and costs, um, uh, anemia, pain, infection, heart failure, sickle cell crises, transfusions, depending on exactly which hemoglobinopathy you have, um, and a lifespan reduction that's measured in decades. Um, and at this point, you know, I think it's safe to say there's really no, um, no, no satisfying general curative um, procedure. Um, uh, HSC transplant can be curative, but entails considerable risk. And on top of that, it's, it's um, not, um, not um, an option for most patients. Uh, in, in this context, um, engineering of HSPCs for autologous transplant um, may offer hope. and. Um, I'm not really doing justice to the broad um, uh, uh, array of, of approaches uh, that are being pursued, but I thought I'd highlight a few of the uh, perhaps more major ones. These include uh, lentiviral insertion of an intact globin transgene, perhaps most visibly um, pursued by Bluebird. Um, gene correction of discrete mutations, for example, a sickle, and, and Matt Porteous has some nice papers on, on, on uh, gene correcting a sickle cell uh, mutation in, in HSPCs. Um, and, reactivating fetal globin as a replacement for dysfunctional or missing HBB. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this last one since that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. So again, probably a slide that, that um, really doesn't need a, a lot of description. Uh, globin switching occurs during development. Uh, we're born expressing gamma globin. Uh, that's down-regulated shortly after birth and uh, with concomitant upregulation of beta. Um, and so that means that uh, if you're a, a, a a person with beta globinopathies, uh, beta globinopathy, uh, you, you're actually carrying around a spare uh, potential uh, beta gene in the form of gamma globin uh, that could take the place of, of your dysfunctional beta, um, if only you can raise its activity. Um, and nature has performed these experiment for us uh, uh, by uh, generating natural mutations uh, that result in HPFH um, with higher amounts of gamma expressed in adulthood and amelioration of, um, of symptoms. Sorry about that. Okay. So in the past, in the past five or ten years or so, a lot has been learned about this switch. And um, again, I'm simplifying a lot of the biology that's that's known at this point, just to emphasize uh, what we've been focusing on at Sangamo. And and the key point is that um, B cell of an A in large measure mediates this switch. Um, uh, the key elements of the pathway are shown here. There's a um, erythroid specific upregulation of B cell of an A, uh, which then leads to um, B cell of an A uh, downregulating gamma. And, um, and this um, scheme uh, uh, immediately points to many possible points of intervention, um, um, some of which include a, a downregulation or knockout of B cell of an A, but, um, but you have to do that in an erythroid specific fashion because it has essential functions elsewhere in the hematopoietic um, stem cell biology. Um, uh, you could also uh, potentially target the binding sites for B cell of an A uh, in the promoter regions of HVG. Um, uh, and, and there's been some nice work from the Crossley Lab um, characterizing, uh, characterizing those, um, those um, sites in recent studies. Uh, but what we focused on at Sangamo is um, actually targeting this erythroid specific enhancer um, and uh, trying to knock out the function of that. Okay, and so. So that's just sort of an introduction. Now I'm going to uh, proceed on with the rest of, of my talk. I'll describe a little bit um, uh, of uh, gene editing with zinc finger nucleases, since that's the technology we use for editing studies. Um, 
Then I'll move on to uh, how we use them to target BC11A to increase uh, gamma globin, uh, and in particular to, to um, discern um, where the key sequence was in this erythroid specific element that you could target uh, for upregulation of gamma. And then I'll talk about lead development studies. Okay, so just a little bit on gene editing with zinc finger nucleases. So um, again, another background slide that um, probably needs no introduction for most of us, but, uh, but just to get us all on the same page. Um, a double strand break enables highly efficient editing. So if you have a, a site targeted nuclease, uh, you cleave the DNA. If uh, during subsequent repair, you, repair, you, you apply a repair template, you can get homology directed repair with a knock in of the corresponding uh, genetic information you supplied in that repair template. If you omit a repair a pair template during, um, during uh, this process, you can get highly efficient gene knockout uh, via the process of non-homologous end joining. Uh, this is a, um, um, uh, uh, a cell process that um, is frequently error prone and will add or delete a few base pairs, uh, forming what are called indels, insertions and deletions. Um, I think it's good to just sort of um, show a slide of what that looks like. Sometimes it's easy to forget exactly um, the, the heterogeneity that you get from this process, and that comes into play later on in my talk. There are um, probably at least five major families of designable nucleases at this point. Um, uh, perhaps the most well-known is CRISPR-Cas. Um, uh, we use zinc finger nucleases, uh, and I'm going to describe those in a few slides here just to give you a sense of, of um, how we design them and how they perform. So a zinc finger nuclease is a synthetic chimeric nuclease that consists of two parts, um, a designed zinc finger protein that binds to DNA, and that's shown here, and the um, cleavage domain from the FOC1 restriction enzyme that catalyzes the cleavage. Um, and and uh, what's really nice about this architecture, uh, well, there's a few things. One, one is that these functionalities are, are quite distinct and modular, so you can, you can separately optimize the two, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later when I describe our um, lead optimization process. But the other is that this uh, protein cleaves only when dimerized. And so since each of the monomers specifies up to 18 base pairs, you can get a, an extended target uh, of up to 36 base pairs, and a cleavage target of up to 36 base pairs specified. And that allows you a great deal of specificity when you're trying to target a, a unique site in a complex genome. Um, in designing zinc finger nucleases, the, the really critical thing to understand is that an individual finger specifies three base pairs. So there's this three to one co concordance between <clears throat> the subunit of design and the, um, and the spanned bases. Um, and then the last sort of thing to point out is that um, the fingers themselves, are, are, uh, their specificity is determined by a key uh, heptapeptide sequence in this part of their um, um, alpha helix. Uh, to make proteins bind to sites of our choosing, uh, we use a mix and match design and assembly process uh, where if you want to say bind this 18 base pair site, um, we can source from an archive of pre-characterized two finger units that bind to six base pair sequences, the ones we want to then uh, take from, from that context and mix and match them into this new context to bind to the corresponding composite sequence. Um, the possibilities are a little more complex than, than what I'm showing here, but um, so we can, we can actually uh, link these in ways that skip bases between these adjacent sites. We can also uh, do things like stick the, um, the cleavage domain on either uh, one end or the other end of the array, uh, and that affords us a great deal of structural diversity in um, making our proteins to bind to um, sites that we want them to cleave. And um, that allows us a great deal of targeting precision. Um, uh, so an example of that is shown here. This is from a recent publication where uh, we were interested in targeting a 28 base pair element within the gamma globin uh, promoter. Um, and we just went base by base with um, dimers centered on each successive base to this region. And we were able to get um, highly efficient cleavage at the majority of these sites. Okay, so with that background, I'm now going to uh, proceed on to um, describing our studies that uh, uh, first identified um, a key element within the erythroid specific enhancer of B11A. And our studies started with um, uh, the studies of, well, they, they grew out of the studies of Bauer et al. in, in the Orkin group uh, in science that was published a number of years ago, uh, where using a, a combination of genome-wide association, uh, association analyses as well as other types of analyses, um, um, uh, Bauer um, 
uh, identified a region that um, was uh, the erythroid-specific enhancer of B. cell A and, and made this really prescient um, statement uh, where he proposed that um, this was a particularly promising therapeutic target for genome ed engineering in hemoglobinopathies. Um, disruption of the enhancer would impair B. cell A expression in erythroid pre precursors with resultant de-repression of HBF while sparing it in non-erythroid lineages. And this was, this was the work <clears throat> and the observation that really got, got the field going in this direction. And it's, it's very important to acknowledge that. Um, but starting from this, um, we set out to uh, more finely map within this enhancer element, this enhancer region, I should say, um, where exactly the critical um, sequence was that, that mediated this response. So our goal was to identify the sequence elements, and our, our analytical pipeline was really quite simple, but, but it's, it's worth going through here. So we would take CD34 cells, we would edit the BCL1A enhancer, then submit those cells to in vitro erythropoiesis and measure percent ganoglobin with the hopes that um, this would allow us to focus in on uh, those stretches of DNA that were most critical for um, giving an upregulation of, of gamma. Um, we started with the observations, so this is now coming from the, can, uh, from the Bauer work again, that the region contained three segments of enhanced DNA successibility. Um, and so our, our initial studies just um, deleted out those entire elements in turn, and they um, identified the plus 58 element as um, yielding the highest gamma globin upregulation. A fine scale analysis of this accessible region. Um, showed regions, subregions of relative inaccessibility. So these are essentially footprints within this um, overall um, more highly accessible region, <clears throat> excuse me, um, at, uh, suggesting the binding of, of uh, regulatory proteins. And uh, in our next series of studies, we then um, developed zinc finger uh, protein nucleases uh, for, um, for these footprints uh, to see which of those perhaps might be um, mediating um, um, the um, um, a gamma suppressive effect. Um, we found that, apologies, so we found that um, of these footprints, uh, we got a really nice signal where when we targeted uh, footprint five with what we call zinc finger pair five, um, we were able to get um, consistently an upregulation of gamma globin during this, um, uh, uh, during, during our assay process. Um, what was really satisfying about this is that if you looked at uh, this footprint in more detail, and you looked at where the, the uh, zinc finger dimer bound, you saw that the uh, dimer actually spanned a GATA site, uh, which is, of course, a, um, uh, uh, an erythroid relevant uh, transcription factor. In a, um, a really key um, experiment in this study, uh, we then went on to um, uh, do the same, same general analysis pathway, except um, before uh, taking the cells all the way to um, the end of differentiation, sorting them uh, into high and low uh, gamma pools, and then sequencing this critical region. <clears throat> and what we saw when we did that was that if you looked at the high gamma globin fraction, uh, you would get 81% disruption of the scata site, uh, whereas if you looked in the low gamma globin fraction, you would get 28% gata disrupted. And what's really critical about this observation is it's not just a question of whether or not you got an indel, but um, you, you would also have indels in this low globin fraction that um, were there but had not disrupted the GATA sequence. Just by, by virtue of, of the surrounding sequence, you can get deletion of a base or two that actually preserves the GATA site and seemingly preserves function. And so this, this provided us um, with a very good indication that actually this was the key element that you would uh, want to target um, if your goal was to make a knockout approach for upregulating gamma. Um, this was published uh, several years ago, um, and shortly after, a month or two after, uh, Canberra et al., um, also in um, uh, the Orkin and Bauer groups, um, published um, uh, an even more comprehensive assessment of this region that pointed to essentially the same element. So, so it's nice to sort of have one, two, two studies at the same time um, converge on the same, the same um, basic conclusion. Okay, so with this, uh, we then sought to uh, develop um, lead candidates, and those studies involved two basic efforts. One was engraftment and differentiation studies, and the other were uh, studies to optimize activity and spe uh, specificity of the leads. And so this is work from our, uh, our partners uh, at um, Sanofi and, and um, at previously at BioVerative. In their studies, they started off by just asking, first of all, if you do, uh, if you do this ZFN treatment at, at scale, 
uh, could you get a high amount of indels, and, um, and how will the cells uh, respond to this um, electroporation treatment? And what was seen in these studies is that um, you got um, a, a good high percentage modification in the 75% or so range, and with um, um, some loss of viability, but overall, overall acceptable levels of viability just coming from the procedure. You could then also ask, you know, is the upregulation of, of gamma globin um, uh, reproduced in, in, this, in this system? And, and the answer was yes. So uh, when, when the cells were uh, transfected, taken through the differentiation process, um, uh, there was a good upregulation of gamma globin seen, uh, both as measured by um, normalization of alpha globin, as well as um, gamma over total beta light globin. Now this is across two different donors. Uh, our, our collaborators also looked at um, um, F-cell frequency and, and also saw a good upregulation of F-cells in the same study. You could then ask, well, okay, does knocking out of this element um, compromise uh, some critical aspect of these preps? Um, uh, does, it, does it change the, um, the uh, proportions of the more committed progenitors or H HSPC cells? Um, does it change the... Um, the ability of the cells to um, uh, the performance in a colony forming assay or in a red blood cell maturation assay. And, and the answer for all these experiments was that um, the ZFN treated cells um, uh, perform just as well as their untransfected counterparts. Um, these were also engrafted into NBS GW mice. Um, and uh, in engraftment studies, you could see comparable engraftment with both untransfected and ZFN treated cells as well as um, uh, comparable, um, comparable uh, representations of the various lineages that you got from these engraftment studies. Um, and finally, you can ask, after 19 weeks of engraftment, um, were we retaining um, good marking? And, um, and uh, the, the study uh, pointed to um, the answer being yes, indicating that we had actually modified the, the long-term progenitor cells. So in a second series of studies, Kaishen Cheng, um, also at our collaborators, um, did clonal analyses. Uh, and the basic analytical pathway is, is um, indicated here. So she started with bone marrow-derived CD34 cells, um, followed by editing of the BCL11A enhancer, um, sorting into 96 wall plates, and then in vitro retroparesis and sequencing. And asked the question of if you bin these uh, cells according to um, knockout status, um, either by allelic knockouts wild type, wild type, or wild type knockout, um, did you see um, any indication that the, the knockout, well, how was how this, this gamma upregulation phenotype correlated with um, knockout status? And what you saw is that as you, um, as you um, knocked out one or both alleles, you got an increase, a statistically significant increase in the amount of gamma that you would get um, after this in vitro erythropoiesis protocol. You could also ask um, how productive uh, was this protocol at generating um, cells, um, and, and did you see any um, did you see any impairment uh, from the knockout um, status? And and the study indicated for two of the donors no no statistical significant um, uh, reduction in um, the amount of knockout. I'm sorry, in the amount of production, um, and in this last donor um, a small um, but but relatively minor change. Um, and uh, similar to the previous studies I've mentioned, um, uh, she also looked at engraftment of these cells um, as well as editing levels retained over time and, and saw the same, same, same results as what I presented earlier. And this paper was published a couple years ago in uh, Molecular Therapy Methods and Clinical Development. Okay, um, so I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about optimizing activity and specificity. Okay, so first of all, for activity, uh, just a one-slide summary, because um, it was a very straightforward, straightforward process. So I mentioned earlier that you know indels are heterogene heterogeneous, and um, at least with the original pair, not all indels would knock out that GATA site. So uh, you could ask, well, maybe you could benefit from moving the site over by a base or two, so that you had uh, a more productive mapping of indel status to knockout status. And so we tried that. Uh, we moved. Uh, we shifted over by one base pair um, the, uh, the dimer and the center of cleavage and asked, does this one base pair shift increase the relative gamma to beta ratio? And we showed that we could reliably get about a 50% um, increase in the amount of gamma produced. We also um, worked on um, optimizing specificity. <coughs> Excuse me. And for this, we used two orthogonal approaches that um, 
uh, really grew out of the, the, the chimeric structure of the zinc finger protein. One, removing arginine phosphate contacts uh, from, the, um, from the zinc fingers to the DNA. These are nonspecific contacts that uh, seem to be um, useful in the native environment for zinc finger proteins, uh, for shorter proteins, say three fingers or so, but perhaps provide excessive affinity in the context of these longer proteins that we make. And in the second uh, effort, we substituted key um, residues within the cleavage domain. And, um, and um, what we've found is that uh, that seems to slow down cleavage, which can also help you um, improve specificity. So essentially what we're doing, if you, if you sort of think about the Michaelis-Menten um, framework for describing um, 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 enzyme reactions, uh, what we really think we have in the zinc finger architecture is a way of tuning the really uh, two key parameters for controlling the specificity of this reaction, right? Uh, if your goal is to, um, you know, you're going to form enzyme substrate um, complexes, right? You're going to form complexes with both on and off target sites. Um, your goal in that case uh, then becomes the ability to um, uh, reject without cleavage those off target sites that have a higher um, dissociation rate, um, but allow through only cleavage at the on target site. Um, and uh, what we're able to do is manipulate K2 and K-1 in order to find the sweet spot and allow uh, the protein to do just that. So let me just uh, provide you with some example data. So um, for, our, um, for our approach to, to tune dissociation rate, um, here's a substitution series where we made from one to five uh, modifications in the right-hand monomer of our um, b cell of targeted uh, ZFN pair. And we then took these proteins and we characterized them, along with the parent, um, biochemically. Right? And this is essentially an off-rate study. It's kind of like a pulse chase. And so what you can see is that as we go from the parent uh, down to the offspring, um, we get a you know, approximately 50, almost 60-fold um, uh, decrease in complex half-life. And what's really nice about this system is that you can see that you know, each individual step in this um, um, in this progression is no more than about, you know, it ranges from about a 1.4 to about a 3.2 fold um, increase in um, off rate. Uh, so you really have a, you know, something that I think could be arguably called a protein tunability. If you take this protein uh, and you test uh, it for specificity in, a, in, um, uh, in, um, in transient transfection analyses, you see that this, uh, this increased off rate um, corresponds with a substantially decreased um, uh, cleavage of this off-target A, 40-fold uh, reduction in off-target uh, cleavage with just this one approach. Our second approach I described was to slow down cleavage by modifying, um, by modifying the FOC cleavage domain. Um, now this is data from a, a system that's, that's uh, not relevant to B. cell of an A. This is from a, a model that we use to study this phenomenon, but it, it exemplifies the point that um, in this system, um, you can retain your on-target modification at very high levels while suppressing what was originally um, a lot of off-target activity down to below the level of detection uh, with the result that you um, increase your um, specificity by, by over a thousand-fold. When we combine both of these approaches uh, to uh, improve, um, um, improve our b cell of targeted ZFNs, uh, we could uh, reliably uh, suppress the off-target cleavage down to below the level of detection. So in this case, we were, uh, we were uh, testing out anywhere from six to eight of these phosphate contact residue substitutions. Uh, this is now across the dimer and, um, and different um, um, FOC domain substitutions uh, in one of the monomers. And as you can see, again, we retain full on target cleavage while um, knocking down off target um, down to below the level of detection. Um, we then uh, took these leads and uh, characterized them by a guide seek analysis uh, with a follow-up um, indel analysis. So this is a standard sort of gold standard assay for specificity in the field. Um, and when we did that, uh, our um, capture results are shown here. Uh, we got, of course, the highest amount of capture at BC11A, and then a, a big step down to what, in our hands, are typically background levels of capture. And then when we followed up uh, with an indel analysis um, in, um, in CD34 cells, uh, we could show um, very high um, on-target indels, 82%, um, uh, with no uh, significant modification seen at off-targets, with a, a, you know, with a background level uh, in this assay in the range of, you know, it varied from locus to locus, but probably um, averaging about 0.05 to 0.03%. Okay, so, so with that, um, 
uh, we had identified um, lead candidates. We, we then uh, took those on and did the, 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 a lot of the standard battery of safety tests. We did tumor disney studies in mice. Um, as, well as, um, as well as a soft agar analysis, karyotype analysis, um, and um, uh, uh, were um, approved for an IND, um, which then led to um, a current um, clinical studies. Um, uh, so this is the uh, trial that's underway. This is what was presented on at a conference call on April 2nd uh, from Sangamo. Um, so uh, we currently have an autologous ex vivo gene edited cell therapy for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. That's, um, again, two trials, one at Sangamo, um, one at um, Sanofi. Um, the, the process is sort of your standard autologous um, uh, gene therapy process. Starts off with a leukophoresis, followed by uh, gene editing, cryopreservation, um, and then uh, reinfusion into, into um, conditioned patients. Um, some other um, key aspects of this are that patient enrollment is ongoing. There's been two patients enrolled. And some of the key, key, um, key things we're monitoring are patient safety, successful engraftment, um, fetal globin, and reduction or elimination of transfusions. Um, and and um, uh, uh, again, a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we um, released our first um, uh, early observations from this study, which I'll share with you um, with a qualifier that they're early, um, and that uh, we'll really need to do additional analyses in the same patient as well as um, looking at additional patients before we can make clinical conclusions. Okay. So um, some observations. The first patient uh, was a, a beta-0, beta-0 patient. Uh, during the infusion, there was a serious adverse event, an allergic reaction uh, to the cryoprotectant, which um, rapidly resolved medical management. Uh, this patient one demonstrated um, neutrophil and platelet recovery within two and four weeks of infusion, and indels were detected in the circulating white blood cells. And uh, the hemoglobin analysis is shown here, um, and it indicates that as of seven weeks out, again, at the time of our release on April 2nd, uh, we saw a stable total hemoglobin with risal, rising fetal hemoglobin, um, and uh, so, so, um, um, so, so um, uh, 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 you know, result that, that looked good. Okay, so just some take-home points. Um, so uh, genome editing provides a powerful approach for identifying regulatory elements, and we use it to find a GATA site uh, required um, uh, for erythroid-specific B-cell vein induction. Um, uh, GATA disrupted CD34 cells exhibit increased gamma globin during erythroid differentiation. Um, these ZFN-edited CD34 cells display normal differentiation and engraftment potential. Um, we have developed highly efficient and specific ZFNs for therapeutic editing of B cell DNA and a phase one, two study of ex vivo edited CD34 HSCs for treating belly thalassemia as well as uh, for treating um, sickle cell disease is underway. Um, I just want to uh, call out a, um, an additional presentation um, on this topic, which will be uh, presented tomorrow by um, Hui Ling, uh, a collaborator from Sanofi. And she'll be talking about zinc finger nuclease mediated disruption, B cell DNA. Uh, in human hepatic stem and pretender cells results in an enriched bioluminescent editing with highly replicable and precise on-target small indels and allele additive increases in field hemoglobin. Okay, so just want to uh, quickly acknowledge um, a, a massive team that over the years have contributed to the, um, the studies I've described today, and uh, also um, CIRM, who funded early uh, uh, portions of this study, as well as our clinical collaborators. Excuse me. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks. be able to accommodate one or two questions, please. Hi, really, really nice, especially the clinical data. Um, can you talk a little bit about the conditioning regime you used, um, sort of the dose, what it was, and whether these patients need to be hospitalized or not? Yeah, so, so I, I, um, I, unfortunately I can't, I don't have that information. Um, let, me, let, me, um, let me try to get that. I'm sure that's been uh, disclosed, I just don't have that available, so Thank sorry. You. Thanks for sharing this data. I was wondering, do you do any screening on the patient genotype? Uh, I'm sorry? Do you do any screening on the patient genotype before to see if any SNP in the patient would create additional off-targets that you're not considering when you do your preliminary testing? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, know we do, I know we do screening of gamma itself, right, because you want to know that the gamma is okay. Um, uh, as for, so I think what you're asking about, though, is genome-wide, um, genome-wide look to see whether you might be getting off-target somewhere else. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. Um, um, we don't. 
Um, but I do want to make a comment on that since you asked about it. Um, and that is that that's been a point that's been raised um, uh, uh, in, in other venues. Um, and, um, and we thought about that from the standpoint of, you know, how, how would ZFNs fare relative to other platforms? And I think, I think we're relatively more resistant to that kind of concern. If you think about it, we have a longer site. So I think that means that any given change um, has less of a chance of forming, you know, a very high affinity off target. I think with shorter binding sites, like with CRISPR, um, where, you know, uh, um, they're unique in the genome, but there may be one or two base pairs away from, from an off-target site, I think you're, you, you have a greater worry that maybe just flipping a single base could, could cause a lot more. But, but the short answer to your question is no, we haven't. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, thank you all for staying at the end of this session. And then let's thank all the speakers again, please.